The Word of God is the basis, it's the foundation for our faith. You are, you are going to tend to view, world, view the world and view things in life through whatever lens you choose to look through. For a Christian, the lens that we should be looking through should always be something that is based upon the Word of God. Because this book is truth. This is God's Word. This is what God says about things. This is what God says about creation and how He made us and what is the purpose of life, what's the meaning of life. How did He create you? What did He create you for? And so we want to look to the Word of God for the answers. In coming weeks, I told you, we will maybe look at some cultural issues of the day, but we're going to start probably in these first few lessons, which may take us, I'm not sure how many weeks, but the first few lessons, we'll, we'll look at what is going to be the foundation for how we must see life and view things through the proper lens. So let's have a word of prayer together. Father, I ask you please to help now. Uh, Lord, I believe these uh, lessons are important and I believe you wanted me to share them on Sunday mornings to adults and teenagers. Uh, our young people are growing up in such a, a, a dangerous time and an evil day where there is so much corruption in the world. Uh, people are now calling good evil and they're calling evil good. We live in a world that's mixed up and messed up and confused and sometimes it just seems like the world's upside down. And it is, Lord. It is upside down. And we know that the only things to make things right side up is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so help us. I pray that every child and teenager and adult would understand the truth and be able to live their life with a biblical worldview. So help us now with these lessons, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone has a worldview. They have a paradigm, they have a standard, they have an ideology through which they see the world. But not everyone's worldview is accurate. Not everyone's ideology is correct. Worldviews are based upon worldviews, sorry, that are based on unbiblical principles will distort or skew the truth and create confusion. God is the one who offers the only worldview that is completely without fault and without error. It is God's truth that will help us to have clear understanding or clarity in some of the confusing or supposedly confusing topics in our world today. Today we want to begin to learn how when we build our lives upon the cornerstone of the Lord Jesus Christ and we allow His Word, God's Word, to shape our worldview, we can stand strong through the storms of doubt and confusion. Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at these text verses this morning if we can. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 through 22. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. The Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, oh, sorry, foreigners, yeah, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. Okay, the saints, the people of God, and the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. There are many differing opinions in our world today regarding significant and important issues such as the origin of life. Where did man come from? The existence of God. The reliability of the Bible. Can you trust the Bible? Or is it just some book that man made up? And many other topics. The conflicting and different ideas surrounding these topics can easily cause confusion in the hearts and minds of those who are seeking the truth. One thing that immediately becomes clear in discussions over, over important topics of life is that the, the worldview or the paradigm or the ideology over significant topics 
And, and just the, the, the way that people view things, the lens through which people view things is very different. You have people in the world today with very radically different opinions about things. Some people don't know what a woman is. Some people don't know what a man is. Uh, where we're living in a very strange world. It's going to be your worldview. It's going to be the lens that you are looking through that is going to shape how you see things and how you feel about things. But it's based on whatever information you have or are willing to look at. How many of you wear glasses or contact lenses? You wear glasses or contact lenses? How many of you? Well, that's a lot of us. That makes me feel good. All right? Some of you, I didn't know you have contacts or whatever, or glasses sometimes. But listen, if I have my glasses on or don't have my glasses on, things look radically different. You are all just a bunch of blurry faces right now. Right? You look so much better. <laughs> No, and, and now that I've gotten old, being close to 50, right, now I can't even see close up without having these bifocals, right? If I didn't wear these bifocals, even close up, things can look very blurry. My kids make f fun of me because if I'm at home sometime and I don't take my glasses off, you know, I got my Bible right here. I have a book right here so I can read it. And uh, I'm getting old, right? But with glasses on or glasses off, it makes such a difference in how you see things. Well, when I have my glasses on, I get to see, see clearly. I get to see the true reality of something when I'm looking at it. If I was looking at something without my glasses, it looks radically different. I won't see things clearly. And we need to make sure that we are looking at things with a biblical worldview. We need to make sure that we're looking at things through the lens of the Scripture and the Word of God and what God says about things. You know, so many people's worldview is completely a man-made ideology that includes no theology. It includes no space for God, no room for God in their thinking. And that's why they are so radically different in their thinking, because they got no place for God in their worldview. And so that's why they think like they do and think like, and, and have the opinions that they do. This is why it's so important that we as Christians develop a biblical worldview as we approach the various topics of life. One way that we can understand the importance of a biblical worldview is to think in terms of a foundation, specifically the cornerstone of the foundation. In New Testament times, a cornerstone was the foundational stone that was laid first and everything else would be built off of that. You lay the, corn <coughs> you, sorry, you lay the cornerstone that's the most important part in the foundation. And everything gets built off of that. Everything is fitted tightly, fitted snugly, fitted close to that cornerstone and in line with that cornerstone. The cornerstone would be the biggest stone in the foundation. It would be totally unmovable once it was set in place. And it was so important because everything else would be built off of that. Think about it. What if you don't have the right cornerstone? When it comes to your thinking about life, when it comes to your beliefs or opinions or thoughts about different cultural issues of our day, what if you don't have the right cornerstone? then all of your thinking about things is going to be off. It's going to be wrong. What if whatever is the cornerstone for your thinking, it's, it's on its edge. It's, it's not just in the right place. You're going to be so off in your thinking and opinions and so on. When the Lord Jesus Christ is your cornerstone, then life fits together the way that God intended it to fit together. When you consider the various topics that we're going to look at in this series, and we're going to talk about things about the presence of evil in our world, and social justice, and the role of marriage, and the significance of gender, you will 
see things differently than the world does because you begin with the foundational truths of the Word of God. That's your cornerstone. So you will see things differently. You will view things differently because you look through the lens of scriptures. The word of God and Jesus Christ is your corner, uh, cornerstone. Or he ought to be. He should be. He ought to be. Everyone has a worldview that is shaped by or it is in line with whatever is the foundation or the cornerstone for their beliefs. For a Christian, the way that you see things and think about things should begin with a foundational cornerstone of the truth, the Word of God. That's, that's my cornerstone. For instance, the Bible tells us that the following is true. You and I were made in the image of God. The Creator made us and He made us in His image. That's a foundational truth. Uh, God has stamped his awareness on your conscience. That within the conscience of man, there is an awareness of God. You have to be educated to be taught that there is no God. Because God made you with an innate knowledge within you that there, there is a God. There is a creator. The Bible teaches us that we have a purpose. There's a purpose in life because you were created by God. You were made by a divine designer. So there's a special purpose for life. You see, people won't understand the purpose of life. People will reject God. People won't understand that they were made in the image of God. They'll, they'll think, you know, this body's my body and it, I can do whatever I want to with it because it's, it's just whatever. But once you understand truth in the Word of God, you understand who created you and who made you and what's the purpose that He made you for. And it changes everything. These statements are opposed to or incompatible with how the world views life. But God's Word gives us a very clearer worldview. Notice the contrast of some of these things between God's view and the secular view. Between a biblical worldview and a secular worldview. God's view says that we were made to glorify Him. You and I were made to glorify God. The secular worldview, you're just made to glorify yourself. You're just made to please yourself. So which is it? It depends on which worldview you have. It depends on what your ideology is. It depends on which lens you're looking at, looking at things through. Listen, if you have a biblical world, worldview, you understand that you were created to glorify God. The, the secular worldview just says glorify self. God's view says holiness matters. Holiness matters. You know, God teaches us to be holy because He is holy. But the secular worldview just says, all that matters is happiness. Holiness doesn't matter. All that matters is your personal happiness. You're to live life to be happy. That's what it's all about. Live and be happy. Achieve the most happiness you possibly can in your life. That's the secular worldview. But God says holiness matters. Holiness matters. God's view tells us that there is absolute truth. There is some absolute, reliable truth that never changes. It never changes. But the secular worldview is relativism. Well, it's all relative. Truth is only truth that's truth to you. The only thing that really matters is really your opinion. True truth is relative. Truth could be one thing for me and another thing for you and another thing for you because it, it really is just based on our opinions and our feelings and how we think about things and so on. But that's wrong. That secular worldview is wrong. There is absolute truth in this world. And we, we have it in the Word of God. We have something that teaches us truth and right and wrong and so on. God's view says that emotion is a byproduct the secular worldview says that emotion is a foundation. 
again, your emotions and going back to the thought of your own personal happiness and your own personal good feelings and so on, that, that's, that's the ultimate. God's view teaches us about personal sin and accountability and standing before God one day, the righteous judge, that we're accountable to Him, we're answerable to Him. The secular worldview says, well, it's just other people's fault. It blames others. Well, the reason I am what I, the, way I, the way I am is because it's somebody else's fault. Or somebody else made me do this. Or I do this because, you know, I was mistreated by my father or mother. Or I do this because somebody else made me do it. You know, we, 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 we can have mobs of people that go and do the things that they do. They go and just, you know, because of some team wins a sporting event, some team loses a sporting event. It doesn't matter. It happens for both reasons. So it's an opportunity. Let's, let's go mob a city. Let's go destroy Montreal. Let's go downtown and let's break windows and let's break into shops and let's steal things. Celebrating a big Montreal, let's Canadians win. Or, or because some team lost or whatever, they'll do whatever, right? It can happen in America, it can happen in Canada, it can happen in Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal and anywhere in the world, right? When people think there's no accountability and no God and it's just about me and me doing what I want to, they'll do all kinds of crazy things and, and blame other people. And somehow we think we've got a right to do certain things because, you know, I'm whatever, it's a messed up world. God's view says that man needs forgiveness. Secular worldview says man is best. God's view teaches repentance. Secular view teaches tolerance. You know, God's view would say, you know, people need to admit they're wrong and admit their sin and turn to God and get right. The secular worldview just says we should tolerate everything. <laughs> tolerate everything. Look at each of these terms with me for a moment. Think about them. Well, God's view defines the purpose of man as bringing glory to God. Secularism says we exist to glorify ourselves. God, who is holy, desires his people to live holy lives. But the world says that happiness must be our one and only goal in, in, in life. God tells us that he has given us absolute truth in the pages of his word. But secularism, secularism says instead that everything is relative and claims that truth is based on each individual's preference or upbringing or their own opinion. God tells us that our emotions are a byproduct of our beliefs and actions. Thus, we're to obey God first and let our emotions eventually catch up. The world tells us, however, to seek pleasurable emotions above all else, even if that means disobeying God to satisfy our own desires. The Bible teaches that all of us are sinners and we're responsible before God for our sin. The world tells us that everything bad in our life is someone else's fault. God tells us that uh, we need forgiveness and need Jesus as our Savior. The world tells us that man is good enough and needs no forgiveness. The Bible teaches us to acknowledge our sin and to turn to God. The world teaches us to tolerate any practice of ours or others, whether or not God calls it sinful. The worldview that is set forth by secular people takes God out of history. It denies absolute truth. It overall insists that man knows better than God, if a God even exists. Man knows better, and man is smarter. And that's wrong. That's wrong. Sadly, it's not just the secular world that embraces a secular worldview. Sometimes churches, perhaps trying to be more relatable to our culture, will fail to declare the absolute truths of Scripture. The more that churches emphasize relativism and just being relative, you know, this, this modern thought that says there's, there's no absolutes, there's no truth, it's just, it's just kind of relative. Whatever you think or whatever is your opinion, well, that, that's fine. That's, that's truth for you. Thinking that right and wrong can just be determined by each individual, that's wrong. The more that churches emphasize relativism, the more people are fleeing Christianity. Emptying out of those so-called churches. A religious study tracked the decline of mainline uh, denominations, religious denominations. 
Their specific re research on the Presbyterian Church led to the conclusion that the primary, decline, uh, primary reason for the decline was a lack of conviction that Jesus alone was the means of salvation. That the church, so-called church, had a lack of conviction that Jesus Christ alone was the only means of salvation. Any theological departure from the centrality and the importance of Jesus Christ is always going to be catastrophic. Any departure from the truth of God's Word always gives us a faulty foundation or a sinking cornerstone that will slant our thinking or our worldview. Out, out in front of my home. You, you know, I'm not, maybe it's like this every place. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is. But you can see how a lot of the, the, some of the concrete work has all broken apart because of things sinking over the years since that house was built. Especially around the steps and so on, right? Like the things outside the, the door of the home and the, the, the porch area and the steps and so on. They've all been sinking and they're kind of slanted now. I'm sure they're not the way they were when they were built. When we depart from the truth, we're on a faulty foundation. We're, we're, we're on sinking sand. Things are going to start leaning and slanting and having a different perspective. How can we avoid the slide of relativism? We need to build on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that way we'll stand. In these turbulent days, in the, these disorderly and confusing days in our wor world, as the world turns its back on God and turns its back on Christianity, it's more important than ever that we understand the truth. We understand God's Word and we have a biblical worldview. We embrace a biblical worldview. For many people, even professing Christians, Jesus is simply a convenience of life, not their cornerstone. It ought not to be that Jesus was just, is just a convenience to you that, well, if, if I, if, if, he, if he help me in a certain area, I'll choose him. I'll want him. No, we choose Christ, but, but he's to be the cornerstone. He's to be the foundational stone for your life. And then every part of your life is built off of that cornerstone. So it's solid. It's not shifting. It's not sinking. It's not affected by the world. If Jesus is not your cornerstone, your life will eventually crumble. But the Bible tells us in our text for today's study that when Jesus is our cornerstone, our life will be steadfast. Our life will be steadfast. Again, there in Ephesians 2, it says, Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. All of life will fit together when the truth is the cornerstone for our life, the foundation for our thinking or for our world view. Let's talk just a little bit more this morning about something. Point number one there in your note is, is this, the reliability of the cornerstone. We're not going to get through all of this, nearly all of this today. We're probably just going to get through a little bit of it. But Number one, the reliability of the cornerstone. A cornerstone is the first piece of any structure, and it must be carefully set so that everything else can be laid against it. If the cornerstone isn't located properly, everything measured from its location will also be in the wrong place. On the other hand, if the cornerstone is located properly and correctly, then everything will fit together and remain solid. For this reason, the cornerstone is costly. The cornerstone is important. We see an example of this in the building of the Old Testament temple. 1 Kings 5 and verse 17 says, And the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, and huge stones, cut out stones, to lay the foundation of the house. It's so important that the cornerstone for our thinking be set in the right place. Otherwise, our entire worldview, it's going to be faulty. It's going to be skewed. It's going to be leaning in a wrong direction. If the cornerstone is not right, if the cornerstone is not in the right place, if you don't have the right foundation in your life. So why must the cornerstone be reliable? Letter A in there in your notes for identity. 
Why must the cornerstone be reliable? Letter A, for identity. The size and the quality of the stone establishes the identity of the structure that is about to be built. The cornerstone is the starting place. It's what everything has to be built upon. For this reason, it's sometimes called the foundational stone. It's a piece of the building that's essential to the integrity of the entire building. Cornerstones are very carefully selected. They're accurately cut. They're precisely placed in order to build a structure. All measurements are then taken from the cornerstone. The more complex or detailed or elaborate the structure, the costlier the cornerstone will be. The cornerstone for our Christian faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Jesus himself. And the foundational truth of Christianity is the fact that Jesus is God who came to earth in the flesh, who, who died on the cross for our sins. He was buried on the cross. Uh, sorry, not buried on the cross. Died on the cross, buried in a tomb. And then up from that grave he arose. Christ's atonement for us is the only hope for sinners. And it's this rock upon which our hope is built. Our hope is built entirely on that Jesus Christ is our rock. He is our cornerstone. The church is a building fitly joined together with Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone holding all of us together. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9 says, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Jesus Christ must be the cornerstone of every church, the one person that the church cannot exist without. Do you know Gospel Light Baptist Church could exist without me? Gospel Light Baptist Church could exist without him or him or her. It could exist without us, but it cannot exist without Jesus Christ. It cannot exist without him. With Jesus as the, uh, the cornerstone for, of the church, Christians become the other stones that help to build up the spiritual house of the church. We'll talk about that in a moment. What's your identity in? What's your identity in? Is your identity in life found in the things you accomplish? Is your identity in life all about the success that you maybe have in your career? Or the amount of money you can make or the amount of houses you can own or the title you can have on an office somewhere? How high you can achieve in some field or some career. Is that all your identity is found in? What you achieve, what you accomplish. If you've been saved, if you've been born again, then the day of your salvation was the day that you received identity with the Lord Jesus Christ. Your identity is now found in Jesus Christ. That's who you are. Jamshid and Sima, my friends, <laughs> right? We are now brothers and sisters in God's family. On Friday in their home, we knelt by the couch and they bowed their head and they prayed and they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They were born again into God's family. Our identity now is in Jesus Christ. It's not going to be in whatever you can accomplish here in Canada, whatever you had back in Iran. Our identity is in Christ. It's in Christ. Has that ever taken place in your life? What about you personally? Is your identity just based on your achievements and your accomplishments in your lifetime? For those who are born again Christians, our identity is built upon who we are in Christ Jesus and as the family of God. Will you personally, uh, will you personally, sorry, will your personal identity be based on seeking the world's approval? Or realizing that in Christ Jesus, you're already accepted in the beloved. For many people, their identity is found in, can I get the world's approval? Can I be, can the world judge me a success or measure me to be a success? Then I'll be something. Then I'll have an identity. No, my identity is found in the fact that I've been accepted in the beloved. Who I am now as a child of God. Who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your identity is going to really be depend on your worldview. If it's all about the world's acceptance and approval and so on, boy, you'll always just struggle seeking them, seeking the world's acceptance and approval. 
things change once you know the Lord. What else in our notes here? Letter B is for unity. For unity. With Jesus as the cornerstone of the church, Christians are the other stones that build the spiritual house of the church. He said, Ephesians 2 and verse 21 says, In whom all the building fitly framed together. Right? It just, it just perfectly fits together and so on. Groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. The Bible tells us that we're fitly framed together. This phrase means that we're joined closely together. We're framed together as parts of a building. We exactly fit together perfectly. It speaks of the unity that we are to have in the Lord Jesus Christ. To be unified as a single spiritual house, we must be fitted snugly, closely together in correct relation to each other and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Part of this connection is the shared doctrinal unity that we have through God's Word. The doctrinal unity that we have through God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us that it is our belief in Christ that connects us to Him as our cornerstone. In 1 Peter there, chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, it says, To whom coming, Jesus, right, as, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Just as bricks and blocks and mortar and so on are precisely placed around the cornerstone of a building, so our lives must be permanently stuck or bonded to the Lord Jesus Christ through salvation and kept in a close relationship with Him. In addition to that, when we are rightly connected to Jesus Christ as our cornerstone, we'll also be rightly connected to other Christians. If you, have, if you have the right connection to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've put your faith in Him, you've come unto Him, you'll also be rightly connected to the church, and to your church family, and to your brothers and sisters in Christ. You'll be kept in a close relationship with them as well. In Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 it says, But speaking the truth in love... may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, whom the whole body, we're talking about a local church, whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint or every member of the church supply it, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. In our giving, singing, and paying attention to the word of God, we as a spiritual house are offering up sacrifices to Jesus Christ, who is the only and the head of the house, the local church. That is what brings those of us in the church together with a common identity and a common unity. And then let her see there quickly is for direction. For direction. As I mentioned, the cornerstone was the one against which the other stones were set. If the cornerstone was crooked, then the angles of construction for the rest of the building, they'd be crooked too. Right? If the cornerstone is leaning, if the cornerstone is out of place, everything else is going to be out of place. With Christ, though, as the cornerstone for the church, we can be sure that the direction is set properly. What is important then is for us who then are make up the church as well. We are fitted together and so on. For us to follow the pattern that is laid for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. For us to follow the scriptures. For each of us as members of the church and a part of that house. Part of that body. The Bible also describes it as. But a part of that house. That we be fitly joined together and snugly joined together with, with unity and doctrine and unity and purpose and unity and direction. Unity in identity because of who we are as children of God, accepted in the beloved, saints of God, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. The pattern is set by the word of God. The direction comes from Jesus Christ alone. One preacher said, the church of God, apart from the person of Jesus Christ, is a useless structure. Our cornerstone is reliable. We can be sure that when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have a sure foundation. And we can be sure that we, when we get our views and our thinking in proper alignment, 
Rez is a mechanic, so he knows something about alignment and getting vehicles in alignment and so on, right? When we get our views and our thing in proper alignment with the Scriptures and the Word of God, to the truth of the Word of God, we can have a sure foundation. So Jesus Christ needs to be the foundational cornerstone, certainly in the church, but also in each one of our lives as well. What, what's going to be the cornerstone? What is necessary for us to be straight and be on the level and be right in our thinking and in our worldview? Christ. Christ needs to be set in place. Christ needs to be the cornerstone, the foundation that your life is, is built upon. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, would you help us to see our need for you and your word and give us a biblical worldview, I pray. Help us to learn much in these coming weeks. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. I ask you to grow us and strengthen our faith and our dependency upon you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.